Nazanin, you had recently um, uh, an article in um, National Post uh, that was um, uh, was put on the front page and also inside. There were a uh, double page there, and it it has a lot of viewers. I I also kept a copy myself here with me. Um, tell me, um, what was it? Uh, I read it. Um, couple of times and uh, tell me about uh, tell the viewers about um, what did you say that it was it made it to the front page of the National mm -hmm. Post well I mean I really just um, spilled everything in my heart that I was feeling that was uh, maybe a few weeks into uh, this revolution and at that time people were still calling it protests protests but what I really want to emphasize was that this was different than what something that we've ever seen inside Iran. And, and I recognize that this time it is, it was, it is a revolution. So I think um, though those words shook the people in the, in the editor editing room that, you know, maybe she has a point and they took the risk to put that on the front page. I basically just summarized everything that was taking place in Iran at that time. And I put some emphasis on certain individuals, some certain teenagers that were killed by suppression forces in Iran. And I think that's what made the difference. And that was when we had first heard the song of Shervin Hajipur, and I had said in my article that he basically encapsulated everything in one song that Iranians were feeling of why they were out there protesting. 43 years of repression that they were feeling spilling out onto the streets. Right. Um, um, so um, did you get some uh, uh, feedback about this? And, uh, and if those feedbacks were um, tuned with your, um, with your thoughts that you have written this article? I got very positive feedback. I'm sure there were negative feedback. I, I didn't receive those personally. I don't, I don't know. The only negative comments I think I heard were from bigoted people, maybe living in Canada, that had read the article saying that this is not our issue. So... Ah. I'm hoping maybe I could follow up that article with reasons why really it is our issue. And in that article, I think I did mention the fact that this is a security risk for everybody. I mean, the fact of having this regime stay in power is an absolute security risk for Canadians and everybody in the world. If this regime obtains nuclear capabilities, then it will be that much harder to bring down this regime. And of course, not to mention funding of proxy terrorist groups throughout the Middle East and what kind of repercussion there is there and you know how many lives we could save and how much more peace and stability we would have in that region and around the world if this regime would cease to exist. Yeah, you brought a very good, uh, good point there. The, the, uh, the Middle East, especially the neighboring countries, they are in turmoil just because of the uh, um, Islamic Republic of Iran's uh, expansionism. So it's, um, I, I'm glad you brought it up. And I, I believe um, through my studies and uh, my daily work that I do, I believe if, and not if, I think the uh, Islamic Republic will collapse for sure, it will, it will collapse. As you, as you brought it up, uh, it is a revolution. Though maybe it's going uh, slowly, but it is uh, going very uh, steady. Um, if uh, when they when they collapse, I think the entire of the region, the Middle East region, will be uh, calm, and will be um, harmonized with with each other. So uh, I, I I think uh, you are absolutely right. Um, well, definitely. Indeed, the Relations with uh, Israel will improve once again. 
They were friends before the revolution. Uh, once again, after the revolution, I believe they'll be friends. If this regime ceases to exist, again, there's the element of them sending weapons and training to Russian forces against peaceful Ukrainians. I think this um, latest has stepped up some European politicians to take a closer look at what's happening in Iran. So yes, definitely there will be more harmony. There will be still problems in the Middle East for some time, I believe, but um, I believe this women-led revolution that we're seeing in Iran will have a domino effect on neighboring countries. I mean, I've already seen protests starting to happen in Afghanistan under their brutal Taliban. So I see Iran could be a real role model for other revolutions to come. Right. Um, Nazanin, I had this uh, question to ask you. Some people, they, be, they may ask, um, you've been absent for some times. Not that you were not involved in, in things, because I, knowing you, I, I was, I, I'm just, the question is basically is for, 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 for the viewers. So I just wanted to exp explain, um, knowing that you were working on the, on the back scene or something, uh, explain to the uh, to the viewers uh, what where were you and what were you doing? Right. Well, basically, when I had to step back, some of my activities was in 2013 when my first son Keon was born. Um, I'm the kind of person that gives my all when I'm focused on something, and I dedicated myself to. Kion and my two other children that came along after him. They're all very young. And so I had to step back from the kind of activity that I was doing before. Before that, I was all in and, you know, every minute, every moment focusing on human rights. Um, but um, as any mother knows, when you're breastfeeding around the clock and you're dropping your kid off at school and doing this and there's it leaves little time um, of course as you just mentioned I never stopped my activities I just wasn't as public I was not doing many interviews because you know the timing just didn't work out and right. I was more focused on providing guidance from the outside trying to link people together and that's what I continue to try to do is try to help unify people together so that we can be more effective in our activities. Right. In this photo, um, I think it's a video, um, I see uh, uh, my grandchildren, <laughs> your, your children, <laughs> <laughs> and, Peter, and, yes. and Peter, and yourself. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's a short uh, video. If it is available, we can look at it. Islamic Republic must go! Hey, hey, go, go! Islamic Republic must go! Hey, hey, go, go! Islamic Republic must go! <laughs> um, uh, I was. Uh, I saw that Kian was also singing, though uh, he, his Farsi is maybe yeah. terrible. But but uh, yes, uh, it's was, so fun around singing. my house. You, every once in a while, you'll just hear them randomly say "Zen Zendegi Azadi," and it's strange coming from their mouth because I don't yeah. hear them speaking Persian. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. Yes. Um, but. but a lot of questions you know it's really interesting sometimes when you're speaking to other people or if, if they overhear me having an interview I don't realize how much they're absorbing and they are and when I was driving in the car dropping one of my kids off to school the song of Sherwin Hajipur came on the air somebody was being interviewed I think it was Karim Sajadpur somebody and my four-year-old son said to me while the song was playing, Mom, they arrest somebody for singing? And it just, just 
stop me, stop me in my tracks. I could not believe how much, you know, our, my kids are, are learning from this. And I'm, unfortunately, they're, they're learning about the injustices happening on. But my gosh, if they knew really what was happening to the children of Iran, they, would, they wouldn't be able to handle it. Right. Well, it's interesting that uh, uh, if, how old is um, uh, how old is he now? Uh, the youngest. Paladin's one. four. Paladin's four. four, and that's why I was able to start my activities again, Baba, because um, this was the first year he went to school, and so it allowed me some time to delve right back into this, and I am giving my all. I mean, I'm, unfortunately, my kids have noticed that mommy's not as present, but um, they know that this is extremely important. This is a crucial time for all Iranians and non-Iranians to take part. This is a historical moment. This is our chance. This is the beginning of the end of the regime. And the sooner we can get our act together and bring some kind of unity, I think... Um, less lives will have to be spared. Right. Um, in one of the interviews you had recently, um, including that the National Post, you said that the revolution started in 2020. And what is your fear? What is, um, what, um, um, what you are uh, frightened uh, about this? Um, if you can uh, say, what I'm most um, frightened, really, what I'm most frightened about right now is that edict that was passed in Parliament. I believe, um, was it 227 parliamentarians out of 290? You might know the right. figures better, Baba, but voted right. to pressure the judiciary to give death sentences to those that are arrested in these protests. I mean, right. this is calling for genocide. This, right. is, this is absolutely frightening. The international community has to take urgent action to make sure that they spare the lives of the 14,000 people that have been arrested. I mean, I, I don't know what to, uh, what to feel because it's just so overwhelming and to, to, to try to figure out what's the next step. I mean, I know what I'd like to see the next step for, for um, G7 countries is to expel their Iranian ambassadors and to recall their diplomats. I want them to take real action. And I have, I've started to see some, some action from them or some stronger language, at least in parliament, where they are pressuring their own government governmental leaders to do something and i'm hoping they're going to pressure the united nations to finally start an investigative mechanism to document the human rights abuses and crimes against humanity and take forceful action just as they had on south africa when there was racial apartheid they have to do the same for the gender apartheid that exists in iran the religious apartheid that exists in Iran and just the the brutality that innocent Iranians are facing daily. Yeah, the, uh, the, the number of two, 277, you know, the, uh, they are chicken, they are, um, they are, uh, uh, they haven't given their names that who are those 277 and those that they haven't, um, seems that either they were sick or they were absent or whatever. And I wrote in uh, one of my uh, comments saying that um, if, if one person get killed or executed because of that edict, um, Iranian people, they would not forget and forgive mm -hmm. those people that they have voted. So I'm repeating it here to them and I send it to um, through um, other um, other media that um, I'm not saying that they are listening to me, but they were um, um, they were I, I, I don't know what came to their mind to to give this sort of uh, 
um, order to uh, ju judiciary to go after these people. Now, I mean, in, in you, any you, regular system, there is a clear separation between judiciary and the executive powers. So, I mean, that in itself should give an indication to these Western countries the way the regime operates, that this is an illegitimate government that does not represent the voice of the people and that they ha that it is a, the, a brutal theocratic dictatorship where all of the power comes from the supreme leader down. Right. Yeah. You, you talked about the international response. Uh, this Monday, um, European Union, they're going to have uh, the resolution. And in that resolution, from what we hear, it seems that um, they're going to have a um, good, um, severe uh, uh, sort of sanctions and plus other uh, punitive um, uh, things coming along. So uh, what else do you, do you think that international community should do aside from exp expelling the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the ambassadors yeah. and stuff like that? I think they need to apply Magnitsky Act, which um, puts asset freezes and travel bans on regime officials and their families. There has to be some kind of mechanism to um, to document the the money that has been stolen by these kleptocrats and been brought to western nations as a haven for their dirty money this laundered money needs to be collected needs to be seized and redistributed back to the victims from of this regime uh, we need to continue to i mean just more of a symbolic role i've been asking with a group of a coalition of Iranian women and world leaders to take Iran off the Commission for the Status of Women. Um, there's different groups doing a lot of wonderful things um, in the community and I'm trying to support their activities, whether it's doctors that are uniting to try to give medical advice um, to Iranians. And of course, the international community and Western leaders can help fund some of these projects. They can help fund um, techni technological and communication um, software to bring to Iran to help them disseminate the news that's happening on the inside of Iran. And there's, there's, there's a lot of different ways uh, governments can help. And, but the, the first thing that they have to do is recognize that this regime is illegitimate and that they start to speak to alternative voices, that they don't have one foot in each camp. I think they're kind of gambling. They don't know if this regime survives, they'll have to negotiate with them. But if it collapses, they have to look like they're on the side of the people. But they can't have both ways. They have to choose whether they stand on the right side of history with freedom-loving Iranians or whether they've chosen to have blood on their own hands by allowing the brutality to continue in Iran with more than 300 deaths, including over 40 children who've been indiscriminately killed in, in this uprising.